All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we only have one presenter for this breakout session, and, and this is the, the first asphalt breakout session. Uh, I think you'll find this first one really interesting. Uh, Leslie Myers, Dr. Leslie Myers with the Federal Highway Administration is gonna talk about the mobile asphalt lab that was up at the Renberg Corner Project this year and, and stationed in Mohall. So let me give you a little background first. Leslie had to travel here, obviously, from back east, and it was her son's 14th birthday yesterday, so she made quite a commitment to get here. Uh, that's a that sacrifice and a commitment. And of course, when they get 14, they really don't want you to be around that much anymore anyway, so it's, it's kind of getting used to the empty nest thing. But, uh, Leslie is, uh, works as a senior asphalt pavement engineer in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Pre-Construction Construction and Pavements and Headquarters and she manages the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center. She also served as the operations team leader for the FHWA Florida Division Office from 2006 to 2009. Probably ran into my counterpart, Jim Warren, for a while. He calls me the Dakota Ghost, because I never get to the... Uh, where she had responsibility for local projects administration, emergency relief programs. Dr. Myers was also an associate professor in civil engineering at Villanova. So please welcome her long ways away, and we appreciate the commitment. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, North Dakota. Really excited to be here. Um, I really enjoyed the, the site visit when we were up here. Um, it was my first time in North Dakota this past September. Always wanted to get up here. Um, believe it or not, there's a lot of people jealous that I got up here. Um, and there's uh, so many people now that have said, wow, I really always wanted to go to North Dakota. So I'm really excited and I really enjoyed meeting everybody um, for the, the week as I was out here. So um, yeah, I'm excited that, that Tyler and Andy asked me to speak today and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the experience and um, I'm gonna kind of also introduce a, a couple of other initiatives that are going on nationally right now. Um, and then this afternoon, if any of you are going to the asphalt conference, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about some of the results of the testing that we did when we were out here on site. Um, I'll also make a plug for um, a little bit later, potentially in April, the date might shift a little bit, but um, Tyler's working to organize a, a, a two and a, a basically a, a three day, a half day, half day and full day workshop on quality in the asphalt paving process. And so um, some more, details about the testing that we did, some of the extra testing we did for North Dakota as part of the project will be presented there. So I work for the federal government. Gary can appreciate this. <laughs> Read at your leisure. <laughs> um, also, no, no uh, acronym soup uh, on the menu uh, left behind. We want to make sure that, so. Um, but I wanted to, to ask, um, just to kind of get a feel for who's here today, I see some folks that I met up in um, uh, the Mohaw area from the contractors and from the, the district. Um, so how many folks are uh, from the DOT? Oh, great, okay, well, uh, yeah. Um, how about some contractors, paving contractors? Okay, um, how about um, local agencies? Any local agencies here? Okay, good, well that gives me a sense for consultants. Okay, good, all right, great. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit uh, today about the visit that we had, and then also um, I just wanna give you sort of hot off the press um, some information about the Resilient Pavement Initiative as well as the um, new Life Cycle Analysis Tool, or LCCA PAVE that's um, coming out from Federal Highway. So many of you, if you work for the DOT, you may already know this, but um, it, sometimes it's good to sort of figure out where we fit in because um, obviously we have a, a, a lot going on in the infrastructure programs. So we have uh, our program offices, and that's where I come from. And many of you know Gary Goff, he's here today, and he's from the Federal Aid Division Office. And so you ha if you haven't met Gary, make sure to introduce yourself. Um, he's your, um, your local representative in the pavement materials area. So um, I am under the uh, Office of Pre-Construction Construction and Pavements in headquarters, and um, Gina Alstrom is our team leader, and we are the pavement materials team. 
And so essentially, uh, we have folks that are dedicated to asphalt and concrete. And I, I think you guys may have at some point had a visit from the Mobile Concrete Technology Center and may have met Mike Prawl. So he's, uh, he manages the other center. Our centers uh, are, you can see the picture there, it's a fully functional asphalt pavement laboratory in the back of a tractor trailer for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, and so we get involved with all things that have to do with asphalt materials and and pavements, concrete. Uh, we are leading the effort in terms of moving towards performance engineered pavements. So North Dakota is one of the states that's been taking the first steps of uh, implementing aspects of balanced mixture design and asphalt. And so that's part of the, uh, under the umbrella for performance engineered pavements, as well as some of the stuff with sustainability and resilient pavement materials. So I'll talk a little bit about the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center. Um, the, the purpose is to really encourage agencies um, and industry to take um, look at specifications and practices and get them to the next level in terms of pavement durability and safety and sustainability. So um, what our program does is really try to make that connection between viable research products and, and practices that are finding success and connecting that into implementation. And so one of the good things is, um, you know, we're we set up in North Dakota, but we can also share practices that we have observed in other states. And then we're able to also take the practices in North Dakota and share them out. And so one of the things, for example, that's um, going to be coming out this year is a one-pager on um, the use of dielectric profiling systems. And um, Amy and, and Jonathan have been giving some information and interviews to Federal Highway to be able to put that out there. And then that shares with all the rest of the states, um, the, the spotlight on North Dakota and what you all have been doing in that area. So how do we do our job? Um, we hold on-site field evaluations and that's what we did. We were up in um, September into October and we were uh, hosted up there um, by uh, the project that we'll look out in a second. Um, we also close everything out with a two-day workshop, which is what may be happening a little bit later on this spring in North Dakota. So Tyler will be leading that effort and setting that up. <clears throat> we do asphalt materials testing in our lab. And then in the last couple of years, we saw both expanded that. So we're doing testing in the field. And many of you may have been out and actually gotten to see some of that field testing on the project. Um, we do post-construction evaluation. Uh, we look at... Um, ways to assist in uh, implementing innovations and part of that is having a equipment loan program and so that's open to um, to universities and contractors and to DOTs to borrow equipment. Um, we're hoping to grow it a little bit more and get some more uh, equipment that's available. We have a, a queue for uh, some of our equipment already so um, typically those loans last from anywhere from you know one to six months. Um, sometimes if there's nobody waiting in line, you can keep it longer. So, and then we also have an opportunity to, to borrow the equipment multiple times. And so we have a couple of contractors and state DOTs that are already starting to take advantage of that. Um, we do both hands-on and virtual demonstrations. One of the things that was really exciting in North Dakota is we kind of had a series of virtual trainings. And so, um, we worked with Tyler and, and Kurt and said, okay, what, what do you guys really want to see so that folks who couldn't make it up to Mohal were able to also join? And I think a lot of you took advantage of that to, to see some of the different tests being run. Um, and that was the first time we had done that, and it seemed, seemed pretty good. There's about 20 to 30 folks on each time, so really appreciate your, your participation in that. Um, we also provide specification reviews, and so we had a... Uh, Ask the DOT, hey, are there any specs that you'd like looked at? Um, you know, we'll just give you our observations um, in terms of what we've seen in other states, as well as um, looking at um, uh, comparing to the uh, what we call the gold medal density states. And so there was a density initiative out of Federal Highway that started about probably about five years ago at this point. And um, they kind of identified key aspects of different specifications, both construction uh, mostly construction specs and density. And so what we do is we look at the specifications and we say, okay, here are where you're also meeting the mark in terms of some of those key features that um, where you have success in getting density. And so 
um, you know, we provide that to our division office, and, and so Gary's had that, and um, and so that it's just some different things that we can do. We also have a stationary um, asphalt binder and mixture implementation lab, so we don't do binder testing anymore in our lab. We send that back to Turner Fairbank, which is in McLean, Virginia, right next to the CIA, so that's always fun when we go there and um, know that we're constantly under surveillance <laughs> when we're there. But anyway, um, that's that's another thing. So that's that lab is kind of set up to do the deeper dive. So if there's something that's like um, going on, they do binder testing as well as other more in-depth analysis. So let's say let's say you're trying to use a local material, and you know you're trying to kind of up your sustainability rating. You're really trying to see, okay, you know what happens if I use this material in varying percentages, and I use it, and and it's something where maybe it's not big enough where you're gonna fund a research project at the university, but it's something that you really want to know and you're trying to, to push forward in one of the initiative areas that we have. That's something where um, we can set up a project. Basically, the DOT work with Gary, request a project from the ABMLID lab, and they would actually, these projects are meant to be turned around in about six months. And so where you want that deeper dive, we also have that option for you. So kind of keep that in mind as you're moving into different things. So our site visit, um, was uh, up in the Moha, um at the maintenance office we set up there near US 83. Um, you can see the dates we were out there. Um, <clears throat> it was a two inch 12 and a half PG 58H28 with a fog seal immediately after construction. Um, haul distance was about six miles from the plant to the project start. Um, and it uh, currently has about 25% trucks, just to kind of give you an idea of like what the heavy vehicle percentage is. Um, and uh, the projected is for about 22% trucks. So um, relatively maybe lower volume, but a uh, decent amount of trucks on this route. Um, and so we sampled mix uh, from September 21st to 24th. And that's what we did our testing on. Um, and it was northbound construction when we did our sampling. You can also see the existing pavement structure out there. Um, so some of the goals, first thing we did is you know, sit down with, with Gary in the division office and, and Tyler and Matt, and we talked about what were the goals for our visit. And so um, some of the goals were to look at the performance of two typical mixes that North Dakota DOT uses. Um, we wanted to demonstrate the use of balanced mix design suite of tests on North Dakota mixes. Um, there was also a request to kind of look at ignition furnace testing for wrap samples, and so we did some side-by-side -side testing with North Dakota DOT on that. Um, we also performed some advanced testing on aggregates, so the fine aggregate angu angularity as well as the aggregate imaging system. I won't present those results today, but those will be in that two-day workshop later on in the spring. And then also gathering material inputs for pavement design demonstration. And that's something that we'll work on trying to set up uh, sometime, hopefully in this year, with Gary and, and Amy. And so we'll do a demonstration of um, uh, you know, the ME design on that. Um, so we also did some side-by-side -side testing, which was really good for us at Federal Highway to get an experience of working with you all, because you all are one of the leading experts. John is one of the leading experts in DPS, and so that was really good for us to kind of look at, you know, are we getting consistency in, in terms of mat uniformity? And then also we did some pavement surface characteristic testing. And so when we talk about macro texture, what does that mean? Um, that is uh, something where you may have a concern for your skid resistance to be compromised. So it's really kind of a surrogate uh, looking at friction, ultimately. Um, and so macro texture is sort of the measure of the voids between your, your aggregates. So if you're looking at like, you know, the aggregates, it's like sandpaper, right? You, the micro texture is the texture of the aggregate itself. Um, do you guys have pretty good texture on all your aggregates out here? Are there some that maybe might break down a little bit more easily than others? My, my guess is yes, right? So there could be, right? And then, so sometimes we try to compensate for that a little bit in terms of the amount of voids, right? So in theory, your, your best choice for macro texture might be something like an open graded friction course. But that's not always practical, especially in cold weather climates. And it's not always easy to construct either. So, um, but this is something that we've been working on and we're investigating testing procedures to be able to use um, 
macro texture, so almost like a prediction of safety for your mix um, in the laboratory mix design phase, not just when you're going out after it's been constructed. So that's something else we concentrated on. These are all the different technologies. We offer uh, several different tests, both on the mixture side and on the material side, as well as some field testing. And all the ones that I highlighted in yellow are the different technologies that North Dakota selected to have um, demonstrated and tested on its materials and, and map. And so we have a, a wide range of tests for performance engineer pavements. Um, we can look at things like how, uh, you know, are we getting the binder that, that was spec'd for, um, which is the, that ABT test or asphalt binder test that just kind of gives us an indication of the true grade of the binder. And then, as I said, <coughs> we the macro texture testing, um, the dielectric profiling system, and then also confirm in place um, thickness. And so I'll go through those this afternoon in, in the asphalt conference. Um, so we've been to North Dakota before. This just kind of gives you an idea of our past visits. And all of those, this pro program's been in place since 1988. So we've been to um, every state pretty much except for um, Hawaii, I guess. We haven't been out there. Um, and we're, we're trying to look at options for how to at least take part of our equipment out there to, to give them an introduction. But last time we were here was actually in 2000, so it's been a while. We're really excited to come out here again. Um, in the past, the focus was on the uh, distribution of, uh, or you know, information about technologies for a strategic highway research program, and then also implementation of super pave. So, what is involved in our visit? Um, we have a, a, you know, basically a sequence of events that occur. Um, many of you participated in the open house, either in person or virtually, and came out while we were doing on-site testing. Um, and then everything culminates in a technical assistance report, which should be to Gary and Tyler, hopefully by the end of this week. And then also um, the quality in the asphalt paving process, which is a, a two-day workshop, which will also happen sometime here in, in 2022. Um, overall, uh, we're involved with you anywhere from six to nine months from start to finish. Um, and so this is um, something that we, we'd like to have this um, you know, really in-depth experience, and then also check back with the state over time, like how are things going, how are things performing, and we're kind of working up into a system where we can start to track that. So that things like the hall distance and the pavement structure, we're looking at that because we're also seeing if we can kind of do um, life cycle cost analysis uh, case examples on the projects that we go out and visit, which also then could be of interest to the state. And so we're, we're looking at how to do that in the future. Um, one thing that was really exciting is the mayor of Mohal actually came and toured the, the laboratory, and that was something really exciting for us because oftentimes we're set up and we get visitors from the contractor and the DOT, but we may not really get any type of interest um, otherwise, you know, from the local community where we're set up. So that was really exciting, and, and we enjoyed that. Um, while on site, what are the different things we do? We do sampling of the mix. You can see Otto doing some sampling there set up. Um, we prepare specimens. We uh, confirm their dimensions and their uh, test worthiness in the lab. We run the testing. Um, we're out on site giving demonstrations of the different equipment, and we're actually measuring uh, the, the field pavement. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that we get involved with, and um, we were very, very excited in North Dakota to have so much involvement from all of you. Um, part of what we do also is provide technology transfer. We do that in terms of like social media bursts. Uh, we have one pagers, these are on our website. Um, some of the topics that we're currently working on, as I mentioned, um, North Dakota, ooh, ooh, I, push, I don't wanna push you, there we go. Uh, we have a, a, a spotlight on North Dakota that'll be coming out this year. Um, and uh, we also have spotlights on different states. So we try to get about, if we can, if we can work with our publication people um, six, uh, smoothly, let's say it that way, uh, we can typically get about four or five one-pagers out a year. So I encourage you, we have spotlights on some of our other states that were posted last year sharing their experience. And typically it's two one-pager series to talk about like how did you get interested in this technology and then, you know, what are you finding in terms of successful practices and what do you plan to do in the future? So it's kind of cool. You can see what some of the other states are doing. Um, obviously, with Minnesota, you guys have a really good uh, working relationship, but you can see what some of the other states are up to. Um, so again, um, our program is a very big asset for Federal Highway Administration. Um, it is unique internationally. 
And so we try to leverage the asset in a lot of different ways. And we're pleased that North Dakota is kind of taking advantage of that, saying, hey, let's look at pavement design example. You know, let's look at some different things beyond just testing the asphalt. And so, um, but that's, that's uh, our program really serves as a pipeline. Um, and so if you have interest in some of the other things you're hearing, just let me know. We can get the experts out to give presentations and, and do things with you on that. So let's move a little bit into resilience. Um, the definition for resilience is, um, uh, has just been sort of revised a little bit, um, I guess with the new bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, but it's the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions. And so really the focus is on adaptation, right? From, from our perspective, you know, we're engineers, we're builders, we're innovators. We know there's changes that are happening. You know, how can we anticipate those and how can we build better? And so that's kind of uh, the, you know, and how do we get back going faster and safely? And, and that's really what it's about, it's adaptation. And so there are different adaptation strategies and what Federal Highway has done over the course of the last three, four years and now is finally able to deploy is, um, you know, how would you go about assessing your system? Um, what are some strategies that you could use? How could you do things a little bit differently to make your roadways more resilient? And so um, this is one of the, uh, and, and I've got uh, in the slides once they're uh, shared with you, we, I, there's two slides full of different references, but all this you can find on our website. The first thing is you wanna look at trends, okay? So you, you measure your pavement condition over time throughout your state. Um, local agencies are watching, right, their, their network and how it's, uh, evolving over time. And there's key pavement indicators that you can monitor. So let's just talk about asphalt pavements. Um, you're looking at things like low temperature cracking, raveling, um, potholes, um, stripping of the, of the surface. And you're looking at those things. Are they occurring more frequently over time? Like is the duration through which they're developing getting shorter, you know, how are things changing? So you wanna kinda of look at trends over time. It doesn't have to be really sophisticated, but are you noticing changes, right? If you know there's certain parts of the state, you're gonna get basin flooding every season, you know it's coming, okay? Are the cracks that, or potholes that are resulting, you know, are, are they occurring in, in, more frequently than they used to? Is it a different severity than it used to be? So what are some indicators that you would track um, and then if you're seeing that, oh gee, there, there are some pavements or bridges where we're seeing these types of distresses occurring at a different rate, then it kind of triggers like, maybe this is something we wanna investigate further. So that first step is just monitoring trends. Okay, what are you seeing? So let's say that you do see that there's a difference in terms of um, trends. And, and all these different, like I said, these different, um, these different sources here are all on our website and this kind of the, there's tools for you to use for each of these different steps that I'm going through now. So if trends are different, right, then you look at, well, is my roadway or my bridge more vulnerable? The trend is changing, but is it really because it's more vulnerable or is it because our aggregate source changed or is it because, you know, we had some um, issues with paving those days or, you know, is there some other reason or can you attribute it to hey, this is just a more vulnerable asset now and it has to do with changing conditions in the climate, groundwater table, et cetera. Okay, so you wanna look at that and when you compare it to other assets on your system, other bridges on your system, right? Other flexible pavements on your system, other concrete pavements, okay, whatever that asset is. And then you wanna look at um, prioritizing the potential vulnerabilities. So the way that you can do that is through something called the Vulnerability Assessment Scoring Tool. And again, this is free. There's a link to it on our website. And basically what it is is a framework that helps you to um, come up with uh, evaluating the vulnerability of your different assets. So your bridges, pavements, culverts, etc. cetera. Um, and then in that framework, and I know it's very hard to see, and I couldn't get a better image of that, but it has d links to different resources that help you do that scoring. And um, so, for example, Maryland DOT is using a customized version of this tool. So they started out with sort of the generic tool that Federal Highway offers, and then they made it localized or calibrate it to their own conditions. Um, and so they're doing it right now to look at the vulnerability of their bridges to climate change. That's kind of what their focus is. 
Um, but essentially what you have is um, you, you come up with a, a relative score, like a relative vulnerability score. And so that score typically runs from one to four. And four meaning you're ranking your assets, your pavement, your culvert, et cetera, as most vulnerable, okay? So what this ha means is you have your system where you go out and you're actually providing maintenance, right? Or repairs on your different pavements, bridges, et cetera. And you consider it maybe in terms of timing or you consider it in terms of budget, right? But now what this is saying is like, all right, let's also consider the vulnerability score, okay? If it's a two, okay, maybe we don't need to really con consider that. We don't change our timing. But what if it's a four, right? What if it's something like, geez, this is just, we're going out and having to fix this over and over and over again. And you rank it as a four, depending on the criteria that makes sense for North Dakota, right? And then at that point, there's another consideration in terms of the timing of maintaining that asset. Um, so that's kind of the idea, is to bring this in as, as something <clears throat> to consider in how you um, maintain your system. The next step then, and that's kind of more, like that could be more project level, right? But you can also look at this from, from a system-wide aspect. And for projects that do have that high vulnerability, you could use this adaptation decision-making assessment tool, which is what you see here, and it kind of shows you the decision tree. <clears throat> that's something else free that you can get from our website. And that helps you determine which solution you want to pursue, right? Okay, now, I know this is vulnerable. I'm going to consider it. I'm going to jack this up sooner in, this, in the timing of what I'm going to fix. What are the best solutions now to address this? It, it isn't just, let's say, you know, a materials issue. It's a vulnerability issue. I can't necessarily go out and dig out this whole pavement and rebuild it, right? So what are the solutions that might work well to make it go from a vulnerability score of four to a vulnerability score of three, let's say, right? Or whatever your goal is. And so, um, and again, so it's a, it, it, you know, at, at this project level, you can do an assessment uh, here, but you can also do this sort of network assessment. Say, okay, oh, throughout the state, I know this zone of my state is gonna be more vulnerable in general because I have, you know, seasonal flooding or whatever it is. Okay, so that's that's saying, and, and really what this is trying to do is help the decision makers at the DOT and local agencies, et cetera, trying to see what what uh, solution is gonna be the best in terms of um, uh, making the pavement or the bridge or culvert more resilient, but then also what works best in terms of life cycle costs, right? We can't, we can't just make money grow on trees. We also have to make some hard decisions in terms of where we're gonna move our money around. So this tool is supposed to help you with that as well, especially when you're answering your politicians, et cetera. Like, why did I change the, the timing of things? You know, am I making things more resilient? <clears throat> and so we're working with different stakeholders across the country to look at this. There's been several rounds of pilot projects. Um, MnDOT's had one. Um, uh, you know, these pilot projects have all had kind of different focuses. Some have been things like nature-based solutions for coastal resilience. Um, others have been just bringing resilience into the whole asset management um, uh, decision-making process. That might be enough. So um, these are these are things that you can uh, look to if you're interested. They're on our website. Um, and like I said, if you just go in and do a keyword search of Federal Highway Resilient Pavements, it'll bring you to the website and you can pull all these different resources off and, and look at those. You can also request training and, and different things like that. So um, quickly, I want to go through also what's the latest in terms of the sustainable pavements. This is um, this is a big thing in our latest bill, right? So um, this is sort of something that has always been there. We've been working on it. We kind of haven't been able to distribute anything about it, and now winds have changed, and it's it's very front and center. Um, and pavements is very much the focus of what, what, what I think a lot of the sustainable stuff is gonna be. So we're, we're gearing up for that, and it seems like it'll be exciting for us, for pavement engineers. Um, and, but let's see, so just kind of, when we talk about sustainability, just, you guys have probably seen these types of images again and again, it's really the triple bottom line, social, economic, environmental, and this kind of gives you, well, in terms of pavement life cycle, where do we fit in? So um, you, with performance testing and going for life cycle cost analysis, that kind of gets to the economic side. Um, in terms of life cycle assessment, we can also do performance testing for that. And then we have things like sustainability rating tools that touch a little bit on some of the social aspects. And so um, 
LCA is the focus here, and um, social impacts generally can be characterized through green rating systems or, or other types of methods. So, and again, I know these are hard to see from the back, and I apologize um, that I couldn't get some, some better images from my colleague, but life cycle assessment is the technique in which you quantify your environmental impacts of products or processes throughout their life cycle. Okay, so you can see in here just a generic product system um, with raw material acquisition, material processing, manufacturing, construct construction, uh, the use phase, and finally looking at the life. Um, and in each of those phases, we have different inputs, right? We have the material inputs themselves. We have the energy that it takes to, to make a product. Um, we have waste, we have emissions, and we have transportation. And so this kind of sounds familiar if you think about pavements, right? Or, or anything that we build. Um, so this is just an example that we have um, from Puerto Rico to show you a life cycle assessment. Um, Puerto Rico is um, uh, some place where they really don't have a lot of landfill space, they're an island, right? <clears throat> and they've got these tires that present a relatively large health hazard. Um, even things that you wouldn't think of, like they've got a lot of mosquitoes and it's pretty hot and muggy down there. And where do you think the mosquitoes like to hang out? In water, right? And where does water tend to hang out when you have a lot of tires all hanging out, right? So, so even just in terms of a health aspect, like they're seeing a little bit an uptick in terms of the mosquito populations because they've got these tires that are just, you know, piled up and they, they have no way to landfill them and they also have no way to reuse them. So one of the things that they looked at is um, how to, to try and build those into the asphalt pavements. Um, and this is probably something we're going to, all this type of, how can we put into the asphalt pavements? Have you guys thought about that or heard about that? You had to have heard about that, right? How do we... I can think of, I see several things out on people's, you know, tables there. How could we put that in the asphalt pavements? I, there was just something that came, could we put waste diapers in asphalt pavements that came through our office yesterday. Um, so, I, I, and it's for real. It's, it's, we have to answer that. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and, 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 okay, that, that might be, that, you know, give it due diligence, but th this is, you know, I don't think this is going away. It's not, and it is something we, we want to be resourceful and think about. So in, ter in terms of Puerto Rico, we ran a life cycle cost analysis for them and a life cycle assessment to see, you know, if we, if we did require a certain amount of ground tire rubber in their asphalt pavements, how would that help them in terms of reducing the excess tires in, in their island? And then, you know, essentially, um, was it really going to give them equal performance, or was it gonna cost them in terms of the life of their pavements? And, and you're just sort of shifting the problem elsewhere. Uh, again, huge uh, image, impossible to see, but what I wanna point out is that essentially they compared on the top, it's just a conventional pavement section, dense graded, okay, asphalt, and the bottom here, what they did is they had to, uh, for a ground tire rubber modified section, they had to add additional binder, about 3% extra binder to, to get the good mixing with the ground tire rubber in it. Um, and uh, they also, because of that, had some extra processing. So the only difference between these two images, as you see here, is on the bottom for the ground tire rubber section, I apologize, I can't uh, point everywhere here. Maybe I can do this. No, I can't. Okay, um, you had the modification of the binder and the additional binder uh, to, to work that ground tire rubber in. But in terms of like transport, construction, end of life treatment, all of those impacts were the same, okay? So the real thing is you're bringing those waste tires in, you have that uh, manufacture of those, you need to shred them, right? Get all of the, the metal out, et cetera. Um, so when we look at the results of the, of the uh, ground tire rubber life cycle assessment, remember that your controlled Conventional asphalt mix had about 6.5% bind, binder. The ground tire rubber had a 8.9% binder in that. And then it had about just under 20% ground tire rubber in, in the mix. So if you think about it, right, this, this is, um, you're making somewhat of a dent in that excess of 3 million waste tires. But it, it's not everything, right? It's not. And, and so um, what you can see on the left is, the, is just the, the impacts, right? So you have 
your materials impacts, that's that blue chunk at the bottom. You have the impacts of aggregate, transportation, mixing. So we're kind of looking at all this on your uh, global warming potential, which is that left side of the thing. So what, what we see, in fact, is there's more global warming resulting from incorporating the ground tire rubber than, than not. Okay, and some of that is that extra material that you're adding, the extra binder, the extra processing of breaking those tires down, the extra modifications to, to have to actually get into the mix, right? The extra mixing, there's emissions, there's energy into that. So um, on the other hand, uh, you know, when we're talking about um, the difference here, what we don't know is how it's gonna perform over time, right? Maybe we get equal performance and, and maybe that extra, or maybe we get better performance and maybe that extra um, global warming potential, you know, is offset by the improved performance. Um, but what we see here, again, materials comprise about 80% of those impacts. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is sometimes we really need to rec recognize that engineering analysis is so Im important. And we're so important to this whole process as engineers and contractors and producers because um, what seems like a good solution sometimes on the surface may not actually get what you ultimately want, which is equal or better performance and reduced uh, global warming potential. So it's okay, it's a, it's a good, um, so you know, this is kind of what we wanna do is look at our LCA PAVE program and hopefully run the um, project, the US 83 project that we were out on, see if we can look at that a little bit. Um, so we'll kind of, I think we'll, when we're reaching back out to do a, a design example with Amy, we'll also look at, hey, should we try to run this through and, and see what other inputs we need to at least do a glossary example analysis. Um, so environmental product declarations, how many of you um, ever, you know, like get a bag of chips and you're like, ah, I really want these chips, but mm, are they gonna make my stomach hurt? And uh, you know, how many calories do they have? Like what's in these chips? Did you ever look at that? What, what's in this food I'm about to put in my body? EPDs are kind of like that. It's sort of that statement of, you know, the components that are in this product. And so guess what? We have a pretty good feel for what type of components are in concrete and asphalt pavements, right? different proportions, et cetera. And so these um, EPDs are a special case. Um, it's already relatively set up well for asphalt mixtures. Um, it's essentially environmental labels that tell us <clears throat> the environmental impacts of the products based on this life cycle assessment. Um, and so this is, um, this is not required by federal law regulation, um, but I, I think you know, this is something that is uh, very likely that we're going to see. Um, and it's gonna be most likely encouraged. And so there's a great opportunity for us all in the industry to, to, to provide that input. And we'll see what happens over time. Um, but um, there are states that already require EPDs in some of their projects. Um, it's called, they call it a green public purchasing. So Colorado and California are already actually requiring that. Uh, Minnesota, uh, Washington, and Oregon have considered it in legislation. I think Minnesota had something come out in last July uh, related to this also in their legislation. And so um, there's a lot of support kind of coming for this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think right now they're trying to figure out with concrete pavements, you know, what, how might this work with the asphalt thing? It's already, Napa's been looking at it for years. It's sort of, um, positioned well that if, if we're told that we are going to do this or if your state decides you are going to do it, I think um, it's in good shape to be able to do that. Um, so uh, this is just, a, again, an impossible slide to see. It's kind of like being at the eye doctor. Um, but the big thing here is um, it's important to note that your environmental product declarations pertain to the production of materials, but that only covers one part of your pavement life cycle, right? So when we have an EPD, it's really about just the production. So for example, let's think about that bag of chips, right? We can look at the bag of chips, we know what's in there, but it doesn't tell us everything about what the impact's gonna be on our body, right? Um, how quickly we chew the chips, right? They're, we're breaking them down. Do we you know, inhale them, <laughs> like my dad used to do, <laughs> and then you know, barely chew? Or are we taking our time and chewing them? That might have a difference in terms of like getting down to your stomach and then, you know, so, so there, when we talk about EPDs, it's really just the material. 
okay? And so it's kind of like design and construction, right? You can do the Cadillac design for your pavement. If it isn't constructed well or something goes wrong on site, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter. There's other factors at play is what I want to point out. And so that graph here just shows us how the, the EPDs of asphalt constituents and asphalt mix fit into the pavement pro uh, product system. But, you know, obviously once the mix is produced, we have to transport it and we have to actually lay it down. We've got to compact it um, and that kind of thing. So, and uh, so we do have a benchmarking tool that's available for free. It's called LCA PAVE. And what this does is um, this, it, it's created with your inputs. So if you're running through the tool, you kind of put the input that makes sense um, for, let's say, a given pro project or for your system. Um, it gives uh, uh, background data sets that you can use in there and you can incorporate uh, material EPDs and just kind of test it out. So so if you want to request EPDs from your local producer and then run different uh, pavement LCA scenarios, this tool is able to do that. It's Excel based, so you can run it in Excel. Um, it uses public background data that are US specific. Um, it, help, <coughs> excuse me, it helps um, add a, a data source. It's relatively easy to use. It's available on the link shown at the bottom of the slide. And then um, also um, one of the things that Federal Highway can do for you is run um, tool demonstrations. So if you want to have a demonstration of this just to see how it works, that's something that you can request from, from Federal Highway. So you can let me know and I can put you in touch with the right people. And again, I think that's something we'll be coming back to Tyler and Amy and saying, hey, do we want to look at a demonstration of this on the US 83 project? Um, and so there uh, is a pooled fund for demonstration projects. You guys are already a part of that, which is excellent. Um, and so what that pooled fund does is um, it provides $250,000 a year for um, uh, technical assistance to state DOTs, looking at whatever project that they're interested in. And um, there's 14 states overall, North Dakota is one of them. And um, some of the topics that you're looking at is the development of balanced mix design for asphalt and performance engineer mixes for concrete. And obviously the project that um, we talked about and I'll give you more details about this afternoon uh, incorporates balanced mix design. So that's part of what North Dakota DOT is looking at. It also is looking at the implementation of strategic pavement preservation programs. So kind of rethinking Pavement preservation. Um, is pavement preservation something that you guys use? I know that we saw the, some of the fog ceiling right after construction. Um, so that's also looking at, can you get more uh, life cycle bang out of your buck for uh, pavement preservation? Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and wrap up and see if anybody has any questions. Um, if you ha are interested in the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center, you can contact me um, or Derek. Um, also, Amir Golalapur is the program manager for the Resilient Pavements Research, and uh, Melina Rangeloff is um, our Sustainable Pavement Research Specialist. So if you have questions on that. We have some time for questions, so make Leslie's trip worthwhile. I'm missing part of a birthday party worthwhile, too. So. <laughs> Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Does anybody have a sibling? I mean, we got a question over here. So. I was going to say, if anybody has a sibling, you'll, you'll appreciate this. The, the biggest gripe yesterday night when I talked to my son once I was out here was that his sister never said happy birthday to him. <laughs> They're 16 months apart, but that was like his, as a how's your birthday? Sarah never said happy birthday to me. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> sure, yes. Well, I, I just noticed that you mentioned the global warming potential figures into the estimate, the design specs coming from the federal highway. And that's something I haven't seen in, in our training here before, is global warming potential. Where did that, is that a, is that, I mean, is that a very, they seem serious about that in Washington. Well, um, I think it's just, what we're trying to do is encourage stakeholders to just, just think about it. Like, you know, just, it's um, what they were trying for, for, you know, ultimately if we're trying to um, build more sustainably, right? That, I, that the global warming potential is one way to sort of represent that. 
So, and it kind of helps, it, like you kind of look at how do we measure impact, right? If we say, for example, for Puerto Rico, if we say, okay, you know, go ahead, you can, Puerto Rico state, you know, the, the DOT, let's say, if you guys decide you want to require, let's say, a certain percentage, like let's take the 20% that they use of ground tire rubber for an example. If they, if they say to Federal Highway, we want to go ahead and we want to require 20% GTR in all of our, in our mixed specifications, right? What we were trying to do is say, okay, let's look at the longer term impacts of deciding that. Like, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of like the life cycle, like, are you gonna get equal performance or better performance over time? It's too early to tell, because this, the, you know, the material's only been down like five years, right? So we don't know just yet the answer to that. But in the meantime, you can use these tools and say, well, overall, just, just getting to the point where like, we've put it down and we've compacted it, what is the impact? How we measure that you know, impact in some way, and that's how they can do that is using the global warming potential, which essentially looks at like the amount of energy that was used and the amount of emissions that were put out, and there's sort of like a calculator of how they do that built into the LCA tool. And so, so what was interesting, right, is that it would be very premature, for example, for them to say we want to require 20% GTR in all our mixes because right now, just looking from a perspective of like what's the impact with emissions and energy, um, it may not, right, it may not be saving in that way. So that performance, and so what Federal Highway is saying, you got to look at what the performance is going to be over time. It's not it's not uh, perhaps the best approach to just specify a you know, recycled material or, or you know what I mean, something like that without really taking the time to look at what the impact is overall. And there's different ways to measure those impacts. So yeah, if that's part of what we presented today is different tools to be able to look at what those are. Not, not to say you have to require them. That's not what we're saying. We're saying here's some tools available. Maybe how might you use them when you're making decisions uh, and changing specs if you're gonna change them. And, Great question and good response, but if I caught your drift too, is there's there's objectives in the IIJA and the new Federal Highway Bill that was discussed yesterday that highlight the need. Now the, the regulations and the processes aren't in place yet, but believe me, where there's a spark, there will be a fire. And so down the line, you'll see this kind of advance, and if you, you've probably been around as long as I have, is that you know way back, and I looked at those federal bills, you know, generations of them, is way, way back before Ice-T, which was in the early 90s. You know, I was, I was sitting in the lab in Cheyenne, and he said, oh yeah, you gotta push the use of fly ash. And it's like, what are they turning our highways into, linear landfills? And it's important that exactly what Leslie said, the Puerto Rican study, is that you evaluate. I mean, yeah, you could burn tires up and, and put them in pavement. But if the pavement only lasts four years instead of 20, that's not sustainable. And, yes, and so that's the important piece, I think, the takeaway. Yeah. By the way, we're up to our time, but I'll get this other question. I have a simple mind. When I look in, in resilience and sustainability are work in progress, as, as obviously Leslie's group is working on, is take away one thing. 1% increase in pavement density is a 10% increase in pavement service life. That's the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. This is a nice lead in because Melissa's in the back of the room, Kurt's here. Next presentation after our break is going to be using the tools, the intelligent paving tools to get better density. So one more question then the break starts downstairs. <coughs> Yeah, um, so I, I, without opening up the tool, there, there are several different factors that you can put in there. And I kind of, the way it is now is set up as like a, it's adaptable. So it could be something like, um, let's say North Dakota, say, oh, let's look at how we might use the tool. You can adjust some of the factors, or you know, you, you can localize it, if you will, to, to what's the conditions here. So Federal Highways tool is kind of open to adapting and so, um, and it's the same thing with the resilient pavement sort of strategies and things. It's meant to be a starting point. And that kind of goes back to your question is what we want to know, let 
folks know is like we've got some tools that you guys can start to evaluate and use. That's kind of the main message of both the resilient and the sustainability. But um, yeah, there's different types of tools out there that you can use and each of them have some of the same core elements, but some of them have additional things. And so we're just kind of presenting the tool that was developed for Federal Highway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're right on time here. By the way, I feel like Jerry Springer here. Anybody want to complain about their childhood? <laughs> Thank Let's you. Let's give Leslie a round of applause and we'll see you back. <laughs>